Hey, what a wonderful day, something no robot would say. I hope you're doing well, and uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to get into Chapter 3, Physical Development in Infancy. Hope you're doing well and having an okay week. See you on the next slide. As I get, in, as I get into this, I just wanted to also like just take a second to, I don't know, just sort of thank you students. Like, you've all been so kind and nice to interact with and it's like in in our current crazy world it's like refreshing and um i don't know it doesn't go unnoticed i very much notice it and i very much appreciate it and so that's why i like even though we're talking about sometimes some heavy topics in a course like this i'm gonna try to like have a bit of fun and like try to realize that like we're all having like sometimes tough weeks or sometimes not but like sometimes we are and i want this to be you know, you come watch these videos, we'll talk about some psych, and I'll be as, uh, try to be as present and as, like, I don't know, I think you know what I'm trying to say, it's like, sometimes diving deep into something that you find interesting is actually, like, a really good way to break out of kind of the habitual negative thinking patterns that we can all sometimes fall into. Um, I love you, it's up in there to sing. Okay, anyways, let's get to the first word of the day. Cephalocaudal. Right, it sounds like this is like a, a trivia word. Um, cephalo meaning head, caudal meaning tail. And what it basically means, it's like, one of these things where it's like the word is way scarier than um than the meaning because all it really means is that the baby basically is growing head down right so it's like and you knew that like you, you knew that like the baby's sort of growing this way you know that babies are born very head heavy right the head occupies a huge proportion of the baby's body weight Physical features tend, tend to differentiate their way down from the top, which is really interesting. Like the baby has control of its eyes before mouth and hands before feet. And that same pattern is true across the body in general. And so this is just kind of saying like the baby doesn't just develop kind of at different speeds randomly. It seems to be like kind of top down and then the next slide is going to be kind of middle out. Right. So the word for top down, head to tail, cephalocaudal. Right, that the top parts of the head, the eyes, and the brain grow faster than the lower parts. And again, it's why we see like differences in behavioral abilities. Infants see objects before they can control their torsos and use their hands long before they're able to walk. Right, this growth pattern explains why the head occupies this huge percentage, right? Like the baby's head's percent of its overall weight is way bigger than an adult's. Physical growth and the different differentiation, so like the parts doing different things, gradually work down from the top to the bottom. Yeah, so this is like, yeah, the babies can use their, yeah, I have it written there too, but they can use their hands way before they can crawl. But it's basically just this idea that like, they're, it's not like every piece is like at 5%, 7%, 10%. It's like pe different parts are, Developing is the word we would use at different speeds. And it seems to be going kind of head down. And then the next slide, I'm going to say middle out. So these are sort of the two words, right? You see the cephalocaudal, you see it represented in the kid, the blonde haired kid on the left, where it's like, you see, it's like kind of down. And then the second word, proximodissal. It just kind of means like the middle and proxy means like a, it's a related to the word location your proximity it's your proxim the proximal distal proximal distal is how you say it it sounds weird when you say it slow but it just means like that and it kind of makes sense right that like the brain and like the lungs and the heart are kind of the major organs are right down the middle and it kind of like so you're developing down this sounds so weird, but if you're thinking of it as like a 3D print, it's like going down and then it's also going out. So proximal distal means it goes from close to far. That's what proximal distal means as a word, near to far. 
sequence at which growth starts at the center of the body and moves towards the extremities. For example, in infants, uh, control of the muscles of their trunk and arms before they control their hands. They control their hands before they can control their fingers. Right, so it's this idea of like, it's like I don't know, I, I don't know how, why I keep wanting to make a robot analogy, but like it's like I'm, I'm kind of gaining control towards the extremities, like the hands, the feet. Hi, coming to you live. <laughs> I was gonna do a cool intro there. I was gonna be like coming to you live from an undisclosed location deep within the Earth's core. There's core, not a good place for a base. Um, I don't know. I'm in my garage. So this slide, we're gonna look at this idea that like you start to see these uh, during infancy, these milestones in infancy, right? These like, or sorry, these milestones in gross motor development, right? And you look at gross motor development as meaning meaning basically big things, right? Like fine motor skills is like your ability to like write or maybe hold the fork and eat and as a kid gets older those develop but the gross motor skills is like this more like big picture thing of like uh you know you can see the pictures as i go across here like first of all like lifting the head rolling stooping or kind of like pushing up standing uh sitting standing climbing walking and, and like some kids like my daughter kind of scooted around on her butt and then was walking like kind of almost skip crawling and so kids like go through all these different ones but these are kind of like the kind of major gross motor development milestones or like kind of goals milestone like you get to there and then you're like at another level and then you're like at another level milestones you know that word i don't know why i'm over explaining the word milestone right but that these are like important steps in them basically starting to develop mastery over their physical body Darn, I didn't time that perfect. Um, but yeah, I, I gotta say, this is kind of fun. Hanging out in the garage, crack a Coca-Cola, the wife and kids are asleep. And uh, it's about, well, my wife's not asleep. She's just upstairs. Um, it's like 10.30 or something like that. Let's talk a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the brain, the infant brain. Also, I'm going to make a few points. I was just thinking I should do this, that like as I'm teaching you this. Um, got the mic right here. So with the mic relatively close, like it's pretty close. To the, it's like it's, it's closer to me than the um, laptop. And if you're doing this, cause what I was about to say there is like, I want to make a few comments about making videos because some of you are, have asked stuff about how to record audio and video. And also some of you have said, and I'm not going to obviously say anything personal for anyone because actually multiple people have asked about video making, about audio making. And I've also had multiple people say that they're like interested in it, but are going to do like a written one for now because of comfort level or whatever, which is totally understandable. And then, but if you want to develop that skill set, like, first of all, my biggest pitch to you would be like, PowerPoint's pretty darn good. And the, the advantage of doing power, using PowerPoint to make your video is that you record it slide to slide. Like if you ever saw, if I ever like just tried to do it one long take, it's like, I'd have a never ending blooper reel. I redo slides constantly. I'm constantly redoing slides. Right, and in PowerPoint, it's like so easy. And then you have you record each slide individually, and then I would recommend you can put transitions between your slides. Right, that just makes it not be because if you don't do that, then it'll just be like a bit of a white flash, and it won't look good. So like basically, just select all all of your slides and then go to transitions. And just use like a fade, just the basic, most basic, but it's still probably the best. So I'm not going to like do an hour on video technique, but all those like pointers are like relevant because then what you do is you set up your PowerPoint, you put that basic transition, right? So like I said, just go to the side where it has all like the files in your PowerPoint, select all of them, and then just put like a basic fade. 
you'll see as soon as you look at it what I mean. And then that handles that. And then all of a sudden what you just did is turn all your individual video clips into a movie. That like is what kind of makes it now work. And then when you're, then you just basically record yourself talking about each slide. If, if you want your video on, if you don't want the video on, you can turn it off and just have the voice like you've seen on some of my slides. You can insert videos and stuff like that and do like a reaction kind of thing. But that's a little more complicated for that. You have to actually have the video. I'm like doing three minutes already. Okay, I'll switch topics quick. But for that, you actually would have to have like, you wouldn't use a video link. You have to download the video file, upload it. There's a way to do that. So if, if people are interested in that, I can just let me know and I can maybe, maybe I'll make a video about making videos using PowerPoint. Because then the thing that's so great is at the end, then you just export it as a video or as, I'm not sure if you can do it just as an audio. But then there's easy technology that once you have a video, you can just, like you just Google quick how to turn a YouTube video into an MP3. It's super easy. Okay, sorry about that. Hopefully I just gave you some time to write down this slide. Let me go on a little point about developmental cognitive neuroscience. Remember, I always do these long long multi-discipline titles like or whatever backwards so neuroscience so it's looking at the neurons in the brain basically the science of your neurons and cognitive implying that it's looking at like how it actually plays out in terms of like making decisions and use of memory and weighing of risk and all this kind of all these like things that we would consider cognitive um, things or operations or whatever and then developmental means as you know in the course like this like how that develops within a lifespan right so how like throughout your life as an in, in infancy at this initial stage right that there's this like extensive development early on of the whole system that's going to be your thinking system but then it brings up this interesting question of it's like it's also like you right it's like and it's not just you because it's obviously you because we're talking about your brain but it's like the you that thinks of itself as you, right? Which in psychology was always called the ego. Mike, not my thoughts or my feelings or my emotions or what I think or that I'm aware of how long the slide is or like any of these like little, it's like, who am I at the end of the day at the deepest, you know, nowadays the word that is kind of more commonly used is self. There's this extensive brain development during infancy, right? When at around two years of age, the brain's about 75% of the weight of the adult brain. So like, so what that means is like, obviously like a adult's head's bigger than a baby's head, but like, and you can see this, like when you have babies and you, if you're around babies, you'll see it like visually easily that like the head is like a bigger percentage of their body than it is for an adult. You could look at the entire, I've, I've kind of made this point in other presentations you've, you've seen, but it's like, you can make a point that like the entire situation around childbirth, like it's from everything from women's hips to the way that the baby's born with a soft spot in the head to allow the brain to be without it's a delicate topic because like for most of human history, having children was a very dangerous thing. Like infant and mother mortality rates are, are much better than they used to be. Right. And it was like, there's a huge cost and risk associated with being with these big brained babies, but that like being able to be, it's like nature or evolution or whatever you want to think of it as, it's like there's been this prioritization of a baby being born with as strong as a cognitive set as possible. And it involves this, well, the brain basically being born It's like wild to think of, but it's almost like you spend two years of development outside the womb then, right? Which we call like infancy. This is where if I was like 
I would sometimes make a comparison to like a deer that's born like with a fairly intact cognitive system and it's able to run immediately because that's what's prioritizing its need for survival. But that in doing that, it makes it a relatively like simple cognitive creature, simple in terms of like brain power. And you got to think that like humans have this extended childhood. You think that like, okay, well, why is the deer so cognitively limited and need to run? Well, that's evolution. It's like, why is human born so vulnerable for years, right? Like my like one year old is like completely vulnerable and like dependent on adult support. There's a huge cost to that evolutionarily, but maybe evolutionarily what kept humans alive was that brain power advantage. And that to have that brain power advantage you needed to do everything and you needed to, I mean, like, like at a genetic level, biological level, whatever possible to ensure that the child's born with the most potentially, most potential filled cognitive system possible. I apologize for the length of that rant, but I think I, I kind of got it together there at the end. At birth, the infant that began as a single cell has a brain that contains tens of billions of nerve cells or neurons. At birth, that brain weighs 25% of the adult's weight. Extensive brain development continues to the, throughout infancy and later on, but especially throughout infancy. By the second birthday, the brain's about 75% of the adult's weight. Because the brain is developing so rapidly in infancy, the infant's head should be protected from falls and injuries and the baby should never be shaken. But the baby's brain does not simply get larger. Through interactions with the environment, individual neurons and the connections among them are shaped, allowing for language, perception, and complex thought. So in the developing brain, I want to like talk a little bit about some of just the science here, right? So a neuron, a neuron is a nerve that handles processing information. And that's like so kind of wild. And one of the things that I, I think that like, as I get older, I don't know if I like appreciated this enough when I was like originally learning some of the psych, like how kind of wild that actually is when you kind of sit back and I keep using the word wild, but wild sort of just means nature. It is like so deeply interesting that, you know, this tiny, tiny cell is processing information. Like what does that even mean? It's like, one of the things that's interesting about psych is like we we have a lot of labels for all this stuff but like still the mechanics are so interesting like how have there that it's like the, with the neurons are like sending both electrical and chemical signals that like the human brain is communicating with itself in basically these two main methods right some of, of the human brain is still electrical a lot of like lower level organisms are like mainly completely electrical like chemical signaling is more advanced. Picture it as like an electrical signal has like one, it can like pass that message or they call it axon potential, but it's like basically energy or signal. It can just, it can shoot it straight through, but it can only do that one thing. But if it's a chemical um, connector, right? So it's like, I'm doing, I don't know why I'm trying to do it with my hands. I should just be referencing you to the picture. So the dendrites are like, I'm going to say this on an upcoming slide, but they're basically like the antennas that take in information, right? So like when different chemicals can drop, it just makes, if there's this connecting with this and they're connecting with a chemical and I can drop different chemicals, then how I can communicate with this has more flexibility than if it's electrical and it's just a straight connection. I hope that sort of made sense. But basically the idea is that your brain connects both electrical, which is like for really fast stuff, a lot of motor stuff, but it also communicates with itself chemically. Like for example, well, I'll just kind of leave it at that for now because on these next slides, I'm gonna kind of get into what all these things mean, like what a dendrite is and what an axon is. and what I mean here by like chemical signals. Okay. And you saw some of this, right? Because you've already seen the presentation on biological beginnings, right? So you already like learned about what a synapsis is and stuff like that. 
Yeah, it's a type of fiber, like nerve fiber. Such an interesting word, sort of, that there's this, these axons and dendrites, right? And the basic way to think about it, or not the basic, but just the most straightforward way to think about it, is that axons, because, right, you know that, like, parts of your brain communicate with each other, right? And the two cells can, like, communicate with each other. And what does that really mean? Well, for one to communicate with the other, there has to be the ability to send a message and receive a message. So the dendrites are what... Um, I say it weird, they're carried towards it, but they are, they're like the antennas that like bring in any signals. And then the axons are what carries messages out. Yeah, pretty interesting. Okay, myelination, very interesting. So it's basically this idea that as these connections are forming and as these communications are, are being established, that they're also so it's like this connects with this and then say these are two cords or two connections right then it's almost like when you look at the cord of like this microphone or whatever or any kind of cord it's like there's the the copper wire or whatever in the middle and then the plastic coating on the outside and myelination is almost like i'm trying to use that as an example of what myelination is it's like an outside coating and what it does is it kind of makes the connection stronger and it makes the flow of information better and it makes it less likely to kind of touch against something else and have a disturbance of signal. So the basic way to think about it is as these connections are being made, myelination is this like, like literally I say there, it's like a, a fatty substance. The myelin sheath. The word sheath is interesting, right? Because it means like, like if you were a sword swordsman or a swords, uh, someone that fought with swords, you'd have a sheath. A sheath is the case for the sword. So this is like a case, the outer case, a fat cell layer encasing the axon. It insulates them, helps electrical signals travel faster. And then myelination is just like the process of how that happens, how, how that happens. So like, for example, you've heard people say that uh, the prefrontal cortex isn't fully done developing until like 23 or whatever. And that's why like people in their teen years are more impulsive than when you're in your like late 20s. And it's like what you don't usually hear people say is that what they're really talking about is the myelination. It's not like the prefrontal cortex isn't there. It's that like those connections haven't reached their final stage of development. It's like everything's not like perfectly plugged in and waterproof. Waterproof's a weird word, but I mean, what I mean is like, so say if you like look at like a cord like this, right? Like the plastic on the outside is like super important for protecting the integrity of the message being sent from the mic to the computer. It's like, it's the same kind of idea. And it's like this one, there's problems in this in the brain. Like there is a connection to this because it, then it's like wires touching and it's, it's a difficult topic too, but that is related to things like multiple sclerosis. Myelination is involved in providing energy and neurons, uh, providing energy and in helping communication. So this is kind of interesting at the end of each back in the house, it's the next day that garage session didn't last super long. It was getting cold and there's a lot of noise outside because of the, uh, storm whatever doesn't matter next slide neurotransmitters right we're talking about neurotransmitters and how at the end of these neurotransmitters at the end of these um of the axons right where they send the messages this is the part that sends the messages there's these like end points right that are called the terminal like end um terminal button at the end of the axons are terminal buttons which release chemicals that are called neurotransmitters you've heard that word probably before into the synopsis which you saw that video about right when you saw like the little represented by little balls of the chemical and and these neurotransmitters of neurotransmitter chemical neurotransmissions that gets released into the synopsis this tiny gap in this into the synopsis this tiny gap between the neurons the chemical interactions in the synopsis uh connect the axon and the dendrites, so like the one cell to the other, allowing information to pass from one neuron to the other. It's a 
pretty wild. Like I was talking about this a few weeks ago, a similar idea with like my Kitchener students. It's like, it's pretty wild to think that of what it means to say that you pass messages and you communicate within your mind through chemicals. It's like, a, it's a chemical type of signaling. There's also obviously electrical, but the higher end stuff is chemical. Brain chemistry. So here's a kind of interesting point, right? So you can see the graph there showing the synaptic density or, and that's like another one of these things where it like sounds super intense, but it just means like how dense or how many connections are there, right? So if there's tons of connections, the density is greater than if there's way less. So I'm going to, if you just wanted to write down those two points, I'm going to kind of just read it in a little bit of an expanded format. Neurons change in two very significant ways during that first year of life. First through myelination. So remember myelination, if you think of like a copper wire and then putting the rubber around the copper wire so that you protect the integrity of the wire, that plastic coating on the outside, that's kind of like what myelination does. It's this process of encasing the axon with fat cell, right? So it's like it, what becomes like theoretically, like, you know what I'm saying of like the plastic on the outside of a cord. It's like, the, the cover of the neuron becomes, it's like, it's like a fatty substance. Begins, this process of myelination begins in the womb and continues through childhood into adolescence. Right, so that's one big change that starts, right, is this, this increased amount of myelination. And then the other thing, second, the, the connectivity or like how connected the neurons are increases creating new neural pathways. So creating all these new connections, right? So basically like the connections are getting stronger, myelination and protected. And then they're also increasing in numbers. New dendrites grow, connections among the dendrites increase, synaptic, uh, synaptic, synaptic. I don't know why I'm messing that word up every time I say it, but I'll start that sentence again. The dendrites, like the branches that take the messages in they continue to grow, the connections amongst them continue to grow, the synaptic connections between the axons and the dendrites proliferate, or like that just means like spreads out, continues to grow. Whereas myelination speeds up neurotransmission, so myelination makes your brain basically more efficient. The expansion of these dendritic connections facilitates the spreading of neural pathways. So it basically is like building the brain. Research has discovered that an intriguing aspect of synaptic connection is that nearly twice as many of these connections are made as will ever be used. The connections that are used become strong and survive, while the unused ones are replaced by other pathways or disappear. In the language of neuroscience, some of these unused connections get pruned is the word, right? Like you're pruning a bonsai. How complex are these neural connections? In analysis by Dahan, so that's just like D-E space, capital H, A-A-N, in 2015, it was estimated, I don't know why I spelled the person's last name for you. It was estimated that each of the billions of neurons is connected to as many as a thousand other neurons. I was like, think how wild that is. Right, that in the brain, if there's like a billion things and they're all connected to like at least a thousand individual things. Right, so the term I have written here is blooming and pruning. So think of like plants, like when plants are in bloom, it means they're like growing or whatever, coming to their full flourishing. And then pruning means like kind of trimming it. And so that's kind of an interesting way of thinking of how these connections are growing in the brain by this like blooming and pruning. And that that process varies significantly depending on what part of the brain we're talking about. For example, you don't have to be writing all this down. I just thought you'd find this interesting. In the prefrontal cortex, the area of the brain where our most high level thinking and self-regulation, so like controlling ourselves occurs, the peak of overproduction occurs at just over three. It's not until middle and late adolescence that the adult density of the synapsis, hang on a sec, just lost my spot. It's not until adolescence that the density, that the adult density of synapsis is achieved. Right, so you'll sometimes hear that like um, teenagers have less impulse control than people in their late 20s, and the reason is because of the myelination of the prefrontal cortex. 
both heredity and so it's not actually that like they don't have a part certain part of the brain or something like that it's that the the coding on the outside of the wiring is not done yet to say it in a simpler way both heredity and environment are thought to influence the timing and course of synaptic overproduction and then the subsequent reduction the blooming and pruning Yes, the synaptic density is believed to be an important indication of how much connection there is between neurons. So here's, okay, one more point. I know I have big, lots of notes here. So you might find this interesting that one of the reasons why it's around myelination is why like a baby can basically see as well as an adult by the time they're one, right? Like I think it's in this presentation or the next one, I'm gonna actually show you like what a face looks like to the baby at the different stages. And by the time they're one, they're, most babies are pretty close to 20, 20. But with hearing, adults don't have, yeah, so like your myelination pathways is rapid for visuals, but auditory myelination does not complete until four or five. So by one, you have a visual system of an adult, but it's not until you're like five that you have an auditory system of an adult. And that's kind of interesting from an evolutionary perspective, right? It's probably more essential for your survival, for your vision to be really good quick than your hearing, even though hearing is important. Right, so a lot of times in developmental psychology, we're talking about what we see when we look at lots of people and we average it out. And then if you ask like, okay, well, why? Why vision first? That's an evolutionary psychology question. Because now you're asking about like, what pressures would have shaped that development? over generations, which is evolution. Development over generations is evolution. So sorry, I'll just put this, uh, I'll just put this up because for some reason I read you all these notes on the last slide, but in case you wanted to have this in your note that like, again, don't get overwhelmed by the words, like a dendritic connections. All that means is like those branches of the cells, like they, expand and they get more and more connected and there's may the baby's making more connections than they need and some of those are going to get strong and used and survive and some of them are going to get replaced and extinguished this is this expansion it's like it's such a brilliant system really it's like your brain produces all these connections that might work and then the ones that do work get stamped or not stamped, myelinated is the correct way of saying it. And the ones that aren't useful get pruned, cut out ruthlessly. And so then your brain's not maintaining all this stuff that's not helping it, right? It's becoming a more and more and more and more and more and more finely tuned instrument, sharper and more clear and more efficient. So just wanted to talk for a bit about the brain, just like the, the forebrain, right? So the forebrain is what we call the forebrain is the cerebral cortex and the structures beneath it. And then you'll hear people talk about the cerebral cortex, like the most evolved, more evolved part of your brain or the newer part of your brain, I should say. And that's like, well, I'll use the word there. It covers the, the forebrain. Right, you can look at the picture there, like a wrinkled cap. That's a weird way of saying it, right? Like it's like a wrinkly hat. You'll notice how like the brain's all wrinkled, right? And that's really sophisticated why that's the case, right? Because it increases all the, the surface area. It actually is like a really important thing. So the forebrain, so sorry, so the forebrain includes the cerebral cortex and some of the structures beneath it, whereas the cerebral cortex is like that top part. And that's the part that has the hemispheres. And this is where we're talking about things like the cortexes, right? And the different lobes of the brain, I meant to say, right? So we're gonna spend a second here looking at the different lobes of the brain. Hemisphere, half a sphere, right? Half of it, the right and left hemisphere. And then there's also lobes. So we're gonna kind of talk about what some of these words mean on the next uh, couple slides. So your brain, it's so interesting, like your brain separated into these lobes. Now these lobes, I just wanna make sure I got the right, all the, hit the button the right amount of times. So the, the lobes of your brain, the four lobes, um, 
are found in the cerebral cortex of each hemisphere, so they're on both sides. They're not the exact identical, they're close. But when I say they're that they're not identical in anatomy or function, that means that they're not like, they don't literally look the exact same and they don't literally do the exact same. Anatomy would be look, function would be do. Okay, so you don't have to write all this down. This is just kind of some extra, but I wanted to give you some info here that the frontal lobe located at the front of each cerebral hemisphere positioned in front of the parietal lobe and above and in front of the temporal lobe, first discovered by Sir Nickus, Nickus Danger. That's quite the name. N-I-K-S, Danger. It is separated from the parietal lobe by a space between tissues called the central scullus and from the temporal lobe by a deep fold called the lateral scullus flap, also called the sylvian fissure. You don't have to have any of this written down. Just, just kind of like showing you how I can struggle through short Latin words. The precentral gyrus forming the posterior border of the frontal lobe right, contains the primary motor cortex, super important, which controls voluntary movements of specific body parts. The precentral region contains the primary motor tex and the premotor cortex. These areas control the movements of the skilled and, and also your posture and everything. The frontal lobe contains most of the dopamine dedicated neurons in the cerebral cortex. So that's pretty interesting in terms of like emotion. The dopamine system is associated with rewards, attention, short-term memory, uh, tasks, planning, and motivation. Dopamine tends to limit and select sensory information arriving from the thalamus to the forebrain. So it also shapes your interpretation of reality. Think how wild that is. That the dopamine in your brain limits what sensory information you're kind of incorporating from your sensories from the thalamus to the forebrain. A report from the National Institute of Mental Health says a gene variant that reduces dopamine activity in the prefrontal cortex is related to poor performance and in inefficient functioning in a brain region during working memory tasks and a slightly increased risk for schizophrenia. The frontal lobe consists of the prefrontal cortex, which is critical for working memory and executive control, which keeps and helps us Focus on complex goals. Okay, so I'm just talking for a long time here about the prefrontal or about just the frontal lobe. The divisions of the prefrontal cortex. So this is all like you'd have to be taking a pretty detailed note to be keeping up with me here and be branching it all off. But like again, I want you to focus more on big picture here. I'm not gonna be like testing you super hard that you know all this stuff. I want you to know basically these four lobes and maybe kind of in general what they're associated with, like the frontal lobes associated with a lot of this, both motor cortex and a lot of the kind of higher end prefrontal stuff, like a lot of the thinking. Plus all these, this note that I'm reading is in the PowerPoint if you download it. Within the lateral prefrontal cortex, there's two different, oftentimes these words are just saying like where it is, right? The And which side it's on and what type of cell it is. The lateral prefrontal cortex, there's two different divisions. There's the dorsal lateral and ventral lateral. Um, again, don't worry about all these terms, just if you can bear through me trying to pronounce all this. The dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is located on the top of the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex and is mainly responsible for like the higher end executive control and how we manipulate memories and how we think through the story of our life, which is called episodic memory. The ventral lateral prefrontal cortex is important for regulating meaningful stimulus that a person experiences throughout their lifetime, such as images or letters or names. Damage to that prefrontal cortex can result in issues with long-term memory, as well as create changes in people's behavior, absolutely, and their ability to plan and organize. Damage can result from lesions or tumors, or also from TBI, like a traumatic brain injury, a really bad hit to the head. Most often a TBI, or traumatic brain injuries experienced within a person's childhood, often in the area of sports or accidents at home, and the other big areas, car accidents or fights. Having a dramatic brain and traumatic brain injury can increase your chances of developing certain neurological, psychological problems or psychiatric problems, such as substance use and schizophrenia. The schizophrenia one like that I know that's a big word to just throw in there because how how is an injury related to schizophrenia? It's 
super complicated. So the study by Jane and, and Stravi Sirivastiavav, that's a tough last name, in 2017 found that schizophrenia symptoms like hearing voices and talking to people that weren't there worsened after substance use for people that had a dramatic brain injury. So pretty interesting. Okay, so that was all about the frontal lobe. I won't do that much on each of them, but then there's the parietal lobe positioned above the optical lobe behind the frontal lobe. This integrates sensory information, right? So this is like what's kind of making what you see and hear and touch and smell and taste all like kind of one big experience. This immersive virtual reality. It's your, it's your, it's your VR goggles. That's a weird way to say it, but your parietal lobe is what's integrating your sensory information across the different modalities like hearing, seeing, all that, including even things like spatial navigation and pro proprioception. Proprioception. I'm definitely saying that wrong, but basically like your spatial awareness of your body. You hear that word in sports sometimes. The main sensory receptive areas for the senses of touch, which is called the mechanoreceptor, which kind of makes sense because it's like when you see it written down, mechanoreceptor is basically like the word mechanize or machine or mechanic, almost the word mechanic and then, but mechanoreceptor. So it's like the part of your brain that's sensitive to touch. Right, so like, sorry, I just lost my spot on this super long note. So I was talking about the parietal lobe. Here we go. Several areas of the parietal lobe is, are also important for language processing. The sensory or the soma, somatosensory, so physical sensation. Soma means physical. Can it be illustrated as the, I'm not sure what I mean by that part. Sorry, I'm reading in my own mind. That makes for terrible video making. Um, the superior parietal lubular and inferior parietal lubal. Remember, this is just like, all this is just saying is like, they're just saying like, the, if I had a diagram and I was pointing, it's like this spot and this spot. It sounds more clear than the intense language. But these are the parts that are associated with body awareness. A lesion commonly in the right... Um, interesting like if you get a cut there or a lesion there it can create this hemineglect or like this lack of recognition of a part of your body which is pretty interesting so then the optical nerve lobe i promise this slide won't be forever even though i'm eight and a half minutes deep okay I'll speed up here the opt the occipital lobe right the i always want to say optical because it's like so associated with vision the occipital lobe is the visual processing center of the mammalian brain, which is an interesting way of saying it, right? You share this with other mammals, containing most of the anatomical regions of what we would call a visual cortex. Yeah, pretty interesting. So this is gonna be, this is heavily involved in things like spatial tasks, spatial, visual spacing, visual, visual spatial processing which is an overly complicated way of saying how you use your vision to process how far things are, how you differentiate between different colors, how you tell if someone's moving or not. Okay, so then just the last one here, the temporal lobe located beneath the lateral fissure of both the cerebral hemispheres of the mammalian brain. The temporal lobe is involved in processing sensory input into derived meaning. So that's so interesting. It's like a big part of like explaining to you what you're seeing. So I'll say it again. The temporal lobe is involved in processing sensory information into derived meaning, into taking meaning out of it for the appropriate retention of certain visual memories or language comprehension or emotional association. Within the temporal lobe is an area called the hippocampus, which you've heard of before, which is key in forming new memories and learning new things. The hippocampus has been studied a lot in the past because of its high collection, uh, correlation with epilepsy. Right, so sometimes people have had that surgically altered. 
and it's had like pretty wild effects. There's like a famous, lots of famous cases in psychology of people that have had amnesia-like experiences after having epilepsy treating surgeries. Although it's been difficult to determine the exact link between temporal lobe and epilepsy, there's a positive connection between the circulatory reorganization with the neurons and the temporal lobe structuring impacting rhythmic activities for important cognition. So basically it's just like there's a connection there somewhere. All right, is anyone still watching? I feel like this slide is way too long. I'm sorry. I'll speed it up on the next one. But the four parts of your, the four lobes or areas of the brain, it's actually pretty, pretty intense. And uh, the language is pretty wild because it's just trying to name this, the, not even the necessarily the part, but the function also, right? So this is why it's like sometimes difficult talking about parts of the brain because sometimes people are talking about like literally parts, like if you were building a Lego and sometimes people are talking about what the parts do, right? So that's the difference between anatomy and function. So next word, lateralization, right? So that just basically means like when when a function or a specialization is on one side of the hemisphere or the other. Charlotte's mom and big sister are gone, so it's daddy and Charlotte and she's a little upset, so you know we had to have a little cheesy break, which won't win me any parenting awards, but is a good trick for to keep in your back pocket. Lateralization is a specialization of the function of one hemisphere or the other at birth. The hemispheres of the cerebral cortex have already started to specialize in this young infant's brain, even in little Charlotte's brain here, right? And if I had her, she's not really a newborn anymore, right? She's a little bit over one. Newborns, they'll show greater electrical activity in the left hemisphere than in the right when listening to speech. When listening to speech. Um, early specialization of the left hemisphere might reflect early auditory experiences. As we will see, the developing fetus is learning about its auditory world during the last trimester of the prenatal development. Okay, so I should have a couple more points, and then I'll stop this, and then I'll keep recording when I get her to sleep in just a sec. Researchers can do no more. Researchers, look, look, who's that? I should wipe your face for the camera. You got Cheetos everywhere. Okay. Researchers continue to explore the degree to which each is involved in different aspects of thinking and behavior and all that kind of stuff. The most extensive, oh, this is cool. The most extensive research on brain lateralization is in relation to language. Okay, fine, one more. Just so I can get to this side. Watch, now she's gonna be completely fine. All that was, she just can see the cheesy bag. Now see how chill she is? She's like the chillest baby. But she was like, ah, 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 constantly, because this was provoking that response, right? So anyways, in relation, I shouldn't have done that, now she's <laughs> in relation to language, the most extensive research on brain lateralization, like how it's each side, is related to the language, some of the most interesting stuff. And it's interesting that speech and grammar are on the left for most people, but things like when it's an appropriate time to say a specific thing, like timing and sense of humor and stuff, seems to be more associated with the right side, which is pretty interesting. Right, so this, thus, language is not controlled exclusively by the left, and that there's actually this, like, complicated interaction between the two. When you're talking about things like reading or performing arts or anything that's like kind of a creative expression. All right, love yous. Charlotte, can you say goodbye and have a great week? She just sees herself for the first time. Who is that? Oh. Oh. Can you say bye, everyone? Have a great week. We love you. From Kitchener to North Bay, shout out. All right. See you on the next slide. So before birth, most of the development that's happening in the brain is happening um, based on the directions of the genes, right? So this is their, the genes mainly are directing how the baby's establishing these basic wiring patterns. Right, but then after birth, the baby's starting to interact with their environment, right? And starting to interact with the sights and sounds and smell and eye contact and language and 
that they're being exposed to and that actually starts to build their neural networks and their neural connections. Right, so assessing an infant's brain activity is not actually easy. A PET scan would pose too much of a risk of radiation for babies. Infants would wiggle too much to allow technicians to use accurate brain imagery resonance, like an MRI. However, researchers have begun using an electrocephalogram, like an EEG, as a measure of the brain's electrical activity to learn about a baby's development in infancy. For an example, one study found that higher quality mother and infant interactions in early infancy predicts higher quality frontal lobe functioning. So that's so interesting, right? That like quality of relationship with mom affects the development of the frontal lobe, which was assessed later in the EEG. What determines how these changes occur? The infant's brain is literally waiting for experiences to determine how connections are made. Before birth, it appears that genes mainly direct the brain's establishing of basic wiring patterns, but that after birth, environmental experiences, nurture, if you're talking about nature nurture, start to guide the brain's development. This inflowing stream of like sensory information, basically, I have here like sight, sound, smells, touch, land, language, eye contact. Eye contact is incredibly stimulating for a baby. It may not surprise us then that a depressed brain Activity is found in children who are raised in deprived environments, so where there's not a lot of stimulation. We actually see then less brain activity, which is a devastating finding. Infants whose caregivers expose them to a variety of stimulus are most likely to develop to their full potential, right? Like kids need like stimulus. Think of what stimulus is, just like interesting things in their environment to respond to. The stimulus can be anything, right? Like anything that you notice that stimulates your nervous system. Right? That's not something you hear or, or taste or smell or see, touch. So this next idea is kind of interesting one. This is called a neuroconstructivist view, right? So think of what constructivist would mean. You hear the word social construction and all this stuff. You, there's, this term is used in different contexts, but in any context, it's, it's talking about how things are constructed or built. built. Right, so neural construction is looking at how, well, how the relationships in the, the between the neurons in the brain are basically how like the wiring of your brain is constructed and it's constructed and through this engagement of what it is biologically, right? So like the nature and then in the environment, the nurture, that biological processes and environmental experiences interact to influence how the brain develops. So you could say like nature and nurture interact to influence how the brain develops. The development of the brain and the child's cognitive development are closely linked. Right, so that kind of is at some point intuitive, but it's interesting to kind of note that, that like one of the reasons why a four-year-old is smarter than a one-year-old is because they're using a different cognitive system. Some of that is how what the actual brain looks like, like the anatomy, and part of that is how the brain actually works, like the functionality or the cognitive functionality. Right now, the brain's development influences the other, the kid's cognitive abilities, and the children's thinking influences brain development. So this is interesting, right? Because it's suggesting this back and forth that, like, as the kid's brain gets stronger, they're able to think more in co more complex ways, and thinking in those complex ways pushes puts pressure on the brain to almost develop even more right so it's just like you have this system that's developing and as it's using itself it's it's pushing itself forward sort of right that a child's thinking and neural activity can influence brain development so this is kind of like talking about the difference between like the the brain and what the brain is doing I won't go on an epic rant about this like I usually do whenever the topic of dreams comes up because it's one of my most, um, it's kind of one of my pet topics or whatever. Infants spend about half of their time that they're asleep in dream, in REM sleep, in rapid eye movement, in deep sleep. They often, or not deep sleep, in REM sleep, and they, they often begin their sleep cycle with REM sleep rather than non-REM sleep. And so this is interesting. So it's like baby sleep, more percentage of their time asleep is dreaming than adults, right? So I say over here that adults spend one-fifth of their night in REM, right? So babies spend 50% of their sleep time dreaming. Adults spend 20%. So that's a significant difference. By the time an infant reaches about three months, their percentage of the time they're spending in REM sleep decreases to about 40%.
and it no longer is at the beginning yet because the other thing that's interesting is a baby drops into a sleep cycle pretty quick that's why you'll learn this if you have a kid yourself it's like when you get your kid to fall asleep you don't want to put them down right away because you put them down right away before they've dropped into that dream they're more likely to wake up if they once they get dreaming once they drop that soother out of their mouth and they're just like well experience that that uh sleep paralysis it's like once you put them down then you're more likely to be able to get out of the room with them still asleep right because like that's what parents learn is like it's one thing to get the kid asleep the, then stay challenge number two is to get them set down in the crib without waking up and then challenge number three is then you getting yourself out of the room like a ninja quietly so that nothing gets uh nothing wakes up the baby so even though a newborn is born incredibly vulnerable right like in totally dependent on the parents they're not completely helpless and although they're unable to crawl or walk yet newborns are equipped with a wide range of reflexes and i want to make this point to you that like reflexes are actually pretty cool right like a reflex is basically a behavior that you didn't have to learn so that's pretty wild right like it's pretty wild that there are behaviors like if somebody blows right into your face or if like wind gusts into your face like you'll naturally close your eyes just like if you went into a baby's face they would close their eye it's like they don't have to be taught to do that right i'm going to show you in a second a chart that kind of shows some of these but like some of these um reflexes are things like that like the babies if you touch the the newborn baby here it'll turn towards that right and that that's actually really important to learning how to feed if you touch them in the middle of the hand look they'll grasp which is really interesting evolutionarily to like holding on to mom um reflexes allow the infant to respond adaptively to their environment before they've had the opportunity to actually learn right so it's an unlearned behavior it's like when you think about it your mind almost blows like what is an unlearned behavior how does that make sense as an idea How do you know to do something that you didn't learn well the, the argument is that evolutionarily these things were so important that human babies that were born with that ability a little bit more than a different baby would be more likely to survive and you know over thousands and thousands of generations what happens with evolution is like this these reproductive advantaged types of behaviors start to get prioritized right so you start to lose weak parts of the gene pool because right? only the successful members of the species are reproducing and if if being able and for a human this is absolutely true but this is also true for like all mammals that like latching to mom and being able to drink milk is like probably the number one predictor of survival right which is called rooting right where the, i said that already but when the infant's cheek is stroked on the side of the mouth that the infant turns its head naturally so then check out this this chart i'm going to show you on the next page so I thought you'd find this pretty neat. So it looks at like, okay, so the, what the reflex is, what makes it happen or what stimulates it, what's the baby's response, and then like kind of how long does it last or whatever. So the thing about this, like, it's like that blinking, right? Like if there's like a right in front of your face, you're going to, sorry, that was probably annoying into the camera, into the mic, but it's like, that's going to make you close your eyes. And it's like, what's interesting to think about is that's going to happen to a 90 year old too that seems to be pretty permanent whereas like that grasping when the middle of the hands touch tends to go away after about three months much less and by a year it's almost completely gone right or like this idea of like fanning out and twisting the foot in when it's when it's touched what's called the, the babininsky reflex disappears after about nine months so pretty interesting eh unlearned behaviors reflexes okay so i think you'll find this kind of interesting so i have here just you've heard the words like fine motor skills to mean like how you write and hold the pen and then gross motor skills is like bigger things like walking and jumping and climbing So here's an interesting idea and this comes from arnold gazelle and this is from his writings in 1934 you may have heard me mention him before and gazelle is like definitely the kind of most often talked about 
geneticist and early psychology. And he discovered that infants and children develop rolling and sitting and standing and these other motor skills in a fairly fixed order, right? Like some kids are different, but it does seem to have some process behind it. And it seems to have like some sequence, like some uh, commonality in the order that people learn that. He argued that that development comes through this unfolding of a genetic plan. It's like the reason why we see certain things before other things in this predictable order is because of these changes at this genetic biological level that are that are facilitating that. His observations were painstaking, but we now know that the sequence of developmental milestones is not as fixed as he originally thought, and that motor development does not reflect a simple unfolding of a genetic plan, but rather an engagement with the environment, right? So you have the, and this is this kind of interesting deep idea, right? A baby might learn to crawl when it sees an exciting new toy and is motivated to reach it. So you can't just say it's crawling because it wants to move. It's also crawling because it wants that thing over there. It's motivated. Perception and action are coupled. Their experience of the world and their movement in that world, well, are coupled, are the same thing. That an infant needs to perceive something that motivates them to act, like that cheesy with my daughter. She's like, ah, it's like, is she just reaching her hand? No, she's reaching at a cheesy. It's specific. It's like, specifically being stimulated by the environment. If it must perceive something that motivates them to act and then use their perception to fine tune their movement, and that's actually how they build their movement capabilities. That's how they generate their motor skills. Without an environment that was motivating them to do it, right, this theory would then predict, you could kind of go the next step to say that that would suggest that a child's development would be lacking. So in this theory, that new behavior, like being able to reach and grab something, is actually the combination of many converging, or, or like converging means like the opposite of diverging, which would mean a stream separating into two. Converging would be like three streams becoming one, right? It's like, um, what was I saying? What converging means? Oh yeah, the new behavior is the result of many converging factors. The development of the nervous system, the body's physical properties, the possibilities of movement, the goal the child's trying to reach, the environment of support that exists for the child. So this is what this dynamic systems means. It's basically like it's complicated, like how they learn is complicated and it's linked, it's immersively linked with their environment. So this is one of my kind of favorite topics. I always love talking about this difference between sensation and perception, right? Like, because it's so fascinating. It's like if me and you walk into a situation and we're both holding cameras and recording, right? And it's like, then at the end of the party, you're like, we both show our footage and our footage is basically the same because we're same side the whole time. It's like what we sensed was the same. But how we made sense of that whole night was very different. So the point I was trying to make, that wasn't the greatest explanation, but this idea that our sensory information is, our sense organs and our sensation, the word sensation in general, means this ability for us to basically take in information from the outside, for us to notice our external world. But then we have thoughts about that. We interpret those sensations. And this is like one of the big ideas that I'll teach about in a different time, but there's a school of thought called phenomenology, which basically argues this idea that like perception's right at sensation. It's not like you, and you know that, it's not like you see something and you're like, hmm, what do I think about that? Like what you think about it is right up at the time delay between when you see it and what you think about it is almost non-existent. It's so fast. Sensation occurs when information interacts with the sensory receptors, the eyes, the ears, the tongue, the nostrils, the skin. The sensations of hearing occurs when waves of pulsating air are collected by the outer ear and transmitted through the bones of the inner ear to the auditory nerve. The sensation of vision occurs as rays of light contact the eye and become focused on the retina and are then transmitted through the optic nerve to the visual centers of the brain. So it's like the your sense organs, think of even what that word means, right? These are like the organs, the tools that your brain uses to know its outside world, to know about the world it's in. But perception is the interpretation of that, how you make sense of it. It's weird how I use the word sense in that, in that sense, but like how you make sense 
of sensation. It's like you do make sense of it. That's exactly the point is that that's what perception is. The airwave that contacted the ears might have been interpreted as noise or as music, for example. The physical energy transmitted to the retina of the eyes might, be, might have been interpreted as a particular color or shape or depending on how it was perceived. Perception brings us into contact with the environment in order to interact with it and adapt to it. Perception is designed for action. I'll say it again, perception is designed for action. You're not just seeing your world, you're seeing your world and what it means. It gives people information such as whether to duck or whether to turn their bodies as they move through a narrow, narrow passageway and when to put their hands up to catch something. It's like you see the ball coming and you're like, oh, that. there's a perceptual aspect, right? So it's like saying sensation is like your recording of the environment and your perception or your taking in of environmental information and your perception is your how you're making sense of that, your interpretation of that. So I thought you may find this pretty cool. So this is like, okay, so on the far left, that's a one month old looking at their mom and then a two month old then a three month old then a one year old. Notice how by the time you get to one year old, you're starting to approximate, this is they're approximating the visual acuity of an adult. So you're basically seeing like at an adult level. Uh, using the visual preference method, this newborn's vision is estimated to be about two to 600, I mean 20 to 600, not 20, 20, 20, 600. This means that a newborn can see clearly from 20 feet what a normal adult's vision can see from 600 feet. But that visual acuity, the acuity or like how clear it is, develops rapidly during the first year and by six months of age, a baby's vision is already to 2040, right? And by a year, it's gonna be at basically 2020 for most babies. So this visual acuity increases and speeds up pretty quick. So this is a pretty classic study in psychology called the visual cliff experiment. So I'll read this to you. You can like kind of check out the picture while I'm reading it. So basically you see the kid on top of that like checkerboard thing. And then the one other half of the table is like a glass, piece of glass, right? But to the baby, it's supposed to, it's like basically you, what you want to do is you put the baby on the one side, then mom goes to the other side and you get mom to call the baby and see if the baby will cross over, right? And see if the baby's basically afraid of that height. So they did this by the visual cliff. They did this by creating a two level checkboard pattern like you see there, one at the height of the table and the other at the height of the floor. The drop off was covered by glass so that it was safe for the baby, but but looks like, like it's safe technically, but it wouldn't look like it was safe to the baby, the idea is. They then place a six to 12 month old infant on the edge of the cliff and had their mother try to coax them to come over. Come here, come here, come here. Most of the infants wouldn't do it. And so the researchers thought that that meant that they might be able to perceive depth. What's really interesting, it's like, it seems like babies as they start to crawl, start to be able to be aware of depth, which is fascinating because another fascinating thing is if you take babies that are even younger and you put them in remote control cars and they can move, they start to notice, they start to be more of a fear of heights. So it seems like this fear of heights and and the, and the movement are connected. Babies in an experimental group were given training in a baby go-kart that provided motion or experience of self-powered motion. When placed in the visual cliff, these babies showed an increased heart rate, an indication that they'd become aware of being at a height. Babies in the control group were not given an experience in self-powered motion and showed no evidence of that increase in heart acceleration. This study provides, provides evidence of perception and action working together in development. It is when the baby begins to move independently that they become aware of heights. How wild is that? To the baby, to the young mind, there's nothing more stimulating than eye contact, especially with mom and dad. It's like, it's so deeply rewarding to the baby. Faces are possible. Yeah, like within hours of birth, an infant will prefer to look at a face rather than any other object and to look at faces it feels are attractive more than unattractive ones. So I want to read this to you because it's kind of inter pretty interesting. Faces are pop possibly the most important visual stimulus in the child's social environment. And it's important that they extract key information from others' faces. Infants show an interest in human faces as soon as they're born. Within hours after they're born, research shows that 
Infants prefer to look at the face rather than other objects and look at attractive faces more than unattractive ones. Yeah, it's so interesting, right? Like the baby's really looking at your eyes and also at your mouth as they get a little bit older and as they start to notice that like those sounds that they're hearing are like coming from people talking. It's like weird to think that they would ever be at a stage where they wouldn't notice that. But really, it's like it's not like they're the world is very confusing to the baby. It's just full of noise and sound. And their brain starts to try to notice patterns, starts to see things and starts to become this first step that we're going to say like categorical, starts to realize like some things are more like this and some things are more like that. And it's, it's starting to develop a system of understanding. It's at this early stage of development. So as you, this is a weird concept because as you start to get smarter, as the baby's getting smarter, it's starting to, first it's noticing that there's things that are making sounds and that things have eyes and that, you know, that then they do these interesting tests like showing them pictures of, of humans and pictures of monkeys and one thing that's really interesting is like six month olds are better at telling between different monkeys than nine month olds that makes no sense right are nine month olds smarter but it's almost like as the baby starts to realize that it's important it's like their their understanding of what faces to pay attention to becomes more human focused. They're they they're almost narrowing what they're caring about, right? So both a six and nine month old show a novelty preference when tested with the human face, showing that they can tell them apart. However, only a six month old will show a novelty pre preference to monkey faces, which is kind of interesting. It's like the ability to tell between different faces is more generalized. See, this is kind of like language where it's like the baby's born with the ability to learn any language, but as soon as they start to learn one language, the ability to learn those other languages starts to decrease. It's like humans, it's almost like as we get better at recognizing the differences between humans, are, there's a cost of that, that we lose some of that generalized ability. This perceptual narrowing is like kind of the opposite of a generalized ability. It's like a, a narrowing that's supposed to assure that we're best shaped with our environment. Yeah, and I think the best example for it is like the the fact that if my kid had been raised in Ethiopia by parents that spoke Ethiopian, my kid would speak Ethiopian. That's an incredibly adaptive ability that any human baby can learn any language. Right, babies also can learn how to distinguish specifically between minor differences in faces that they're exposed to all the time but the cost of that is losing some of that general ability it's so so interesting so auditory experiences um for the baby will you know technically begin in the last two months of pregnancy the baby's starting to like they have a fully developed it's not to adult level but they're hearing sound for sure Immediately after birth, an infant can't hear soft sounds as well. They're better with like, with louder sounds, obviously. And this is because of what I was saying before, the myelination of the uh, auditory system isn't like fully completed until about five. By three months of age, an infant's perception of sound improves, although some aspects of perceptions do not reach an adult level until five and some aspects even 10 years, like knowing where sound comes from. Infants are also less sensitive to the pitch of a sound than adults are. Pitch refers to the frequency, like how pitch, like, I don't know how I was going to try to do that with my voice, but like frequency means like how aggressive up the wave goes, right? If you see like, sorry, I struck my desk, it probably sounded terrible. But if it's like, you see like a sound wave, right, that goes up and down, it's like, well, how much is it going like up and up? And like, that's like the frequency of the wave is like the ups and downs. A soprano's voice sounds high-pitched, a bass low-pitched. Infants are less sensitive to low-pitched sounds and are much more likely to hear high-pitched sounds. By two years of age, an infant has considerably, considerably improved their ability to distinguish between sounds of different pitch. They also become much better at localizing sounds after, after two years old. Right, so that's the idea of like, I sound over here and I turn this way, I don't turn that way and I don't look over that way. So this is kind of an interesting point I like um, that most perception is intermodal. Another one of these words is just a fancy word that means combining, that, that means something relatively easy, like it means combined. Like it's like 
um, you remembering a piece of pie that your grandma used to make. Like some of that memory is visual. Some of that memory is um, like the taste of it. Some of it's maybe the smell of it. So that'd be an example of how, how your memory is intermodal. So perception being intermodal means when you're making sense of your world, you're walking into environments and you're you're making sense of this kind of combination of things. When you look and listen to what's going on, you don't just experience sights and then sounds as if they're like separate things. You experience this as this like unitary episode of your life, right? This is called the intermodal perception, which involves integrating information of two or more sensory mod modules, modalities is the word it says, not modules, right? So two or more sensory modalities, or, that, or, or yeah, modalities. It just means like, when you walk into a haunted house and you're scared, it's because it's dark and it's because it feels eerie and it's because it, there's a weird smell. It's like multiple things, right? Intermodal. Most perceptions intermodal. There's a lot of redundant information in the world and this redundancy plays an important role in facilitating this kind of cognitive development during infancy is that these things are as the baby's doing things over and over, this redundancy, you're like doing things over and over and, you know, standing up on the step over and over, standing up on the step over and over. That's what my daughter's doing like a million times a day. It's like, that's actually, she's learning that that push and the feeling of change of elevation, all those things are like, it's intermodal, right? Meaning combining more than just one thing, integrating information from two or more of the senses. So Piaget had this idea that you basically, the, as the baby's adapting and going through their world, they're dealing with, they're trying to deal with new environmental demands, right? And their their cognitive system is adapting. And he uses these, some of these words, like, I'll try to explain these, like a schema. So a schema would be like, if say you play basketball and I throw you a basketball and I tell you to take a shot at my net, it's like, you're not going to be like, well, where do I hold my hand? And do I point the ball up or do I bounce it towards the net and like, how do I, where do I look when I shoot? It's like, if you know how to play basketball, you're just going to look and shoot. It's like, you've remembered how to take a jump shot or whatever as like a set plan, a scheme of how to do it, a scheme, right? That children don't learn these like individual isolated memories. They learn like these kind of pattern schemes of how to do things and how to live their world. And the simulation is when the child's like trying to use the model that they have of their world to understand maybe new information right and so sometimes their model works and sometimes it doesn't and when it doesn't then they need to accommodate and adjust their schemes infants not only perceive sounds and visual patterns they also develop an understanding of how objects and people in the world work to navigate their world babies need to learn that the objects exist even when they're out of view that objects fall if they're not supported that objects belong to certain categories, that people have goals and they're doing things for reasons and that some people are good and other people are mean. Piaget's theory is a general theory. It unifies this story of how biology and our experience shape our cognitive development. Right, This Swiss-born child psychologist named John Piaget, he thought that just as our physical bodies have structures that enable us to adapt to the world, we build mental structures that help us adapt to the world. Adaptation involves adjusting to these new environmental demands. Piaget stressed that children actively construct their own cognitive world and information is not just poured into their mind from their environment. They're actually constructing a world based on that information. He was interested in discovering how children at different points in their development think about the world and how their thinking changes. So just as a heads up, right, like that's like a, a pretty likely fair game for a test question, right? So I'm saying like Piaget had this idea that basically you're going through your life and you have this idea, you're trying to adapt to your world. And how you adapt to your world is you have this model that you're trying, you have the world as it makes sense to you in your mind, basically, right? The child has their understanding of the world and they're trying to use that understanding to inform how they're doing things, right? And they're trying to even when they come up to new information, it's like, well, I've never done this specific thing, but I've sort of done things like this. And let's see if this new thing can be assimilated into my model, added to and become part of, excuse me, that's what assimilate means. And then sometimes it's going to work and it's great. And sometimes it's not going to work and accommodations and changes have to be made. So this is just a fancy kind of language way of saying the child's 
making a model of the world and then playing that out. And sometimes things don't work, and you, it's back to the drawing board, and yeah, they have to, you know, develop a new strategy. And it's not like they're aware that they're doing it and like able to explain it and articulate it out loud. Obviously, they can't. This is happening way under the, the surface. So Piaget thought that kids were at these had these different stages of development where they were like qualitatively different. It's not just like a little kid is just a weaker thinker than an older kid. They're actually processing information in their perceptual and sensory world in very different ways. So let's look at that. Yes, yeah, so this point that an infant constructs an understanding of the world by coordinating their sensory experiences with their physical and motor actions. That's a wild idea that like how my daughter right now, Charlotte, that you saw a few slides ago, how she's making sense of her world is she's basically moving around in it and she's seeing things and hearing things and touching things and tasting things and um, smelling things. But she's so that's like the sensory part. But then she's also moving around, right, and trying to get into everything. And that's like the motor side. Right, so that's actually so fascinating that what he's basically saying is like a child's experience of the world is basically sensory motor it's based on their sensations and their movement at the beginning of this stage infants have little more than reflexes to work with at the end of this stage they can produce complex sensory uh, sensory motor patterns like maybe climbing upstairs and can start to use primitive symbols like early language Piaget observed that infant's reaction to when an object disappeared. Like this is going to be like related to like peekaboo. Like why does peekaboo work on a kid? Well, because they're not at the stage yet of having object permanence, of understanding that things exist even when they're not right in front of you. Dad's like coming in and out of existence, right? So it's very rewarding when dad's head pops back up, right? Like my daughter Charlotte, when she gets going on pick, I should take a video, but like she'd play all day. If, you, if It's like so rewarding to her. Um, and yeah, but then eventually they'll get to a point, she'll get to a point where I'll go like, where'd daddy go? And she'll just pull my hands down. Cause she'll just, she'll reach a point where that trick doesn't work on her anymore. Piaget observed how infants reacted when an object disappeared. If an infant searched for the object, it was proof to Piaget that that infant knew that that thing still existed. Right? So if all of a sudden it disappears and the kid's like looking for it. Right? So whereas a nine-month-old will search for a hidden object, young infants often don't. Based on this kind of evidence, researchers conclude that object permanence is something that develops later in infancy. Right? That, but that a very young infant, their experience of their world is so in the moment. They're so in the moment. They're com they, think if you were like a mindfulness meditation expert, you're like so sensory motor. That would be an interesting way of saying it, that you're like so present right now that your experience of the world is how you're literally interacting with it through your movement and through how your sense organs are interpreting it. So it's a pretty, pretty deep idea. So just a couple other words I want to go over here that are related to cognitive, these layers of cognitive development. You've heard some of these, right? And like, you've heard of conditioning, like, whether we're talking about classical conditioning or operate conditioning or just conditioning in general, this idea of like how rewards can be used or punishments to affect behavior. Now, usually that's in general. In this sense, we're talking about rewards specifically. Infants can learn through operant conditioning. If an infant's behavior influences the probability of the behavior's reoccurrence. Infants, so basically like infants can learn that what their behavior does will lead to certain effects and then will do that effect more, right? Like Charlotte knows like, <laughs> if she just does that enough, it'll like bug me enough. I'm like, fine, another cheesy. It's like, you have to be careful with that, right? Because they're kind of training you too. Um, But yeah, so like there's there's that aspect that infants' behaviors is going to be influenced by things that are finds rewarding, right? And some of that's going to be stuff like food. Some of that's going to be stuff like parents' attention. What is attention? The baby's starting to like, the infant's starting to improve their cognitive abilities, right? And one of that is attention. And I, I put there is like attention is basically at its basic level, just the ability to focus 
your mental resources on specific things. Right? If I'm like, pay attention, what am I saying? It's like, stop looking over there. Stop looking on your phone. Stop talking to your friend. Like, look at the screen. Focus your mental resources on this specific PowerPoint. But that's, that's me just trying to explain the word attention. Join attention, though, is this idea of like, or actually here, before I get to that, I want to read this. It's kind of interesting. Attention or the focusing on mental resources on a select information improves cognitive processing on many tasks. Newborns can, can detect a contour, like a contour would be like a bump and fix their attention on it. Older infants can scan patterns more thoroughly. By four months, infants can selectively attend to something. Individual differences in attention during pregnancy can also predict cognitive functioning differences later in life, which is interesting. <clears throat> Another aspect of attention is the role that it plays in this idea of joint attention. And this is gonna become interesting and important as the kid gets older. Joint attention is like, if you're listening to me talk right now, we're kind of, even though there's this time delay, right? Because it's a recording, we're kind of engaged in joint attention. We're paying attention to the same thing at the same time. Let's say you're sitting there, maybe watching this with a, a friend in your class and you're both taking notes. It's like you're both paying attention to the same time. Right, and as, as kids get older, they get better at that, right? And they, the ability, they get better at kind of paying attention to the same thing together. Instead of just playing beside each other, they start to play the same game together. And part of being able to play the same game together, which is called parallel play, or like, or sorry, parallel play is like playing beside each other. Like right now, if I put Charlotte beside her cousin Henry, who's about the same age, they'd both sit there and play with stuff. But you wouldn't really, even if they're playing with similar toys, they're not really, it's not the same as like the older kids in the backyard running around pretending that they're like fighting dragons with sticks and stuff. Like they're in the same mental world. They're showing joint attention. But by the end of the infancy stage, the baby's starting to develop the ability to do that as you get close to two. So this idea of joint attention is actually pretty interesting, right? It's like, what's it required? It's like me and you playing with Lego together that we're able to like tell him, I'm like looking at something, you can see my eyes and you're like seeing what I'm looking at and that's like, so you can tell that we're kind of focusing on the same thing where joint, joint attention is also this idea of like as babies get closer to one, here's another example, is they start to like point more, right? And it's like, what's pointing? It's like, she's like wanting me to look at what she's looking at. And it's got this like interactive component, reciprocal back and forthness. It's like she wants to point, but she also wants me to look and she wants us to have that like shared experience. Early in infancy, joint attention usually involves a caregiver pointing or using words to direct an infant's attention. I do that with every child all the time. We walk around the back here, look at this, look at this, look at this. And then she's starting to do it with me too, like I was saying. Emerging forms of joint attention occur at about seven to eight months, but it's not until about 10 to 11 months that this becomes more frequently observed. By their first birthday, an infant begins to direct an adult's attention to objects that capture their interest. Yeah, and it's, then this next point is actually really important. I should read it because it's super relevant to any of you wanting to work with kids. This idea that joint attention plays a super, a really important role in a lot of aspects of infant development um, and really increases their ability to learn from other people. Now, that that's not super surprising, right? Like everybody, regardless of your cognitive level, if you were able to just pay attention more, you would be better at learning. Like if you could, especially if we go back a slide and say, what's our kind of base definition of attention? Just the ability to focus your resources on one thing. So the fact that the developing ability of the child to focus on one thing or de demonstrate attention, that that's linked with like school performance later is, you know, not super surprising. Okay. So um, you all obviously heard of like memory. Maybe you heard of memory. No, I'm just joking. That's a terrible joke. Obviously, you've heard of memory, but like in its basic sense, like in the most basic sense, memory is basically the, just the ability to remember information or retain information over <clears throat> over time. 
sometimes for a few seconds, like remembering how poorly I started this slide, and sometimes for a lifetime, like remembering, you know, the birth of a child or something like that. Now, an interesting thing is that, like, I just wanted to make this point about memories. Some memory is implicit and some is explicit, right? So an explicit memory, I'll start with that one, even though it's the bottom one, is like, if you can tell me, like, exactly what kind of happened on the weekend or whatever, it's like an actual conscious memory about an experience or about something. An implicit memory can be something about, like, skill and routine and that, it's not necessarily associated with conscious recollection. It's like you walking up the stairs is based on the idea that you've done it a bunch of times. It's memory based, but it's implicit memory based. It's not like you're going through a cognitive, the same kind of cognitive process you're going through with other things. It's like it's so heavily integrated, especially with something like that that's integrated in the motor system. Right, so think about, it's kind of, kind of wild. It's like you're sometimes using memory without even noticing it, just in how you're doing things, right? And just how you've learned to behave. Think of what that means, learned to behave. Well, to learn something, you have to remember it, right? To learn to behave a certain way, there's a memory aspect of that. So, Sometimes explicit memory or this idea is called episodic and sometimes implicit memory is called procedural. And that's in, in some ways different, better language because like episodic means like or explicit memory means like your memory of the story of your life. And then implicit memory, sometimes called procedural, is more about this idea of like, well, it's why people with amnesia still know how to talk and still know how to walk and can still, if you pass them a sandwich, know that they have to bring it to their mouth and start to take a bite and then chew it it's like they don't lose everything about being a human there's certain behavioral things that they remember even if their cognition and uh, memory centers are severely impaired now well the people that kind of forget how to walk quote unquote forget how to walk is more commonly a situation where there's been an acquired brain injury that's actually injured the the motor cortex right like the part associated with walking so that makes sense that's not the same as like forgetting how to walk, right? That's not like literally memory. Oh, but see, that's a, it kind of is. It's just that procedural memory. It's that muscle memory, we call it, right? In common speech. So you might find this pretty interesting, right? Like why you don't remember the first couple of years of your life as well. And some people will say that they can and... Um, you know, the hardest thing about like, if someone's like, oh, I remember when I was like six months, it's like, it's kind of hard to prove that they're wrong, right? Just as hard as it is for them to prove that they're telling the truth. But most people report not remembering much before three and maybe a few random intense memories, maybe if it's in the twos. Some of you might report earlier and it'd be interesting. So this infantile or childhood amnesia is this interesting thing, right? That like most adults remember almost nothing at that time. It was like highly significant. We consider it like developmentally, maybe the most important time of your life. We think that one reason for that is that the prefrontal lobes that are important in storing memories, right? That are important in this autobiographical memory or how we're tying, think what autobiographical memory is. It's like, like an autobiography would be a book about you. It's like part of your memory system operates to create this like movie of your life, this book about you. And the prefrontal lobe is doing that work. It's playing this important role in making sense of these things. And that's it's at a relatively immature stage early on. At the end of the second year of life, our long term memory starts to become more sustainable and reliable. So like here, there's interesting things is like. I kind of tried that with my, I tried, with my kid. I tried to like rig the system of like showing her a picture of her as a baby, like a lot. And as she was getting older and like seeing if I could like help her remember. So it's like, it's, it. So like, okay, what am I trying to say here? Developmental psychology would say, okay, as developmental psychologists, we'd say that what we see when we observe children is that there seems to be very little memory retention or recallability, I should say 
for people before year three of their life. And we think that the prefrontal lobe has something to do with that. Why? Well, now we're getting into an evolutionary psych psychology question or evolutionary psych question, biology question of like, maybe the, the brain is in such a developmental sensory motor stage that it's in a stage that's actually preparing it for another higher level stage. And if you were to strap down that sensory motor stage with more adult cognition, it wouldn't be able to kind of develop the soil and foundation for those important next steps. Because the brain's totally like that. The brain builds towards the next step. And they, like, this is so interesting in the sense of like how kids, that what I was saying before about sleep, right? That like a kid's sleeping tons, or they're dreaming a lot of their sleep time. And that's interesting because we know that dreaming is like heavily related to cognitive development and maintenance, right? That like one, the most surefire way to destroy someone's mood is to like wake them up every time you start to see them dreaming during the night and really interfere with their dreaming. And it's like, then they'll feel completely unrested all the time. So anyways, what I was saying there is just like, it's interesting that the child's in this very dream-like sensory motor place. And at the same time, they're not really remembering most of that. It's very interesting why and how that all operates. So this next point I want to make is just about like the idea of concepts and then the idea of categorization, right? That as the baby's starting to look at the world, they're starting to realize that like, Okay, I have some cousins that are boys and some cousins that are girls. Like the gender difference is one of the first things kids recognize. You know, I have some cousins that have the hair the same color as me and some that have hair different colors. Some of my cousins are taller than me. Some of them are shorter. All this is perceptual categorization, right? The baby starting to like understand that like, okay, I can start to make sense of my world. I can start to say like, okay, not there, everything's not random. Some things are more similar to other things than they are to like, something else right like some these are all balls that you play games with these are all toys these are all types of food these are all people it's like that ability to start putting things into categories or categorization is like one of the first kind of signs of this developing um increasingly developing cognitive structure of the infant concepts like what is a concept it's like a grouping of like, like we have a concept in our mind of like what a what athletic equipment is or what a sport equipment is right you'd see like if i was to show you i could have done this but the opposite way if i just showed you like a soccer ball a hockey puck a football and a basketball and said like what's common about these it wouldn't take you long to be like oh those are all like sport sports gear it's like okay well sports gear is a perceptual category but Within that, you would have a concept to just tie these two words together. You'd have a concept of what a sport thing is. Well, a sport piece of equipment is like something we use to play sports, right? So it, you see that it becomes like a closed loop. It's like balls can be that. Maybe the clothes could be that. The shoes could be that. But there's things that aren't that, right? So it's like, so I haven't been the most articulate on this slide of explaining this idea, but it's basically just this idea that the child's starting to realize that like you can start to label things in the world and that things have a consistency to them, right? Because without concepts, like I say there, each ob object and event in the world would seem completely unique. You'd be able, unable to make any generalizations or notice any patterns, right? So a key part of being able to function in the world is to realize that like there's a lot of patterns and there's lots of similarities and like it's these young infants are starting to form these categories and then as they're getting older the nature of their category is getting more fluid and more or not fluid's not the right word more adapted and dynamic and more complex these are all my friends but i like these friends more and these are the friends that i would say this to and these are the friends i would play sports with so even the what i mean by that is like even the category of friends starts to get like subdivisions and that's called categorization. Okay, so language. You obviously know what language is, but it's like one of the most interesting things humans do, right? This ability that I can like sit here and 
think thoughts in my head and in like almost real time without even thinking about it except that I'm talking about it so I'm thinking about it my body's be able to use my my tongue and my throat and my vocal system to create audio disturbances that the microphone picks up and that get saved into this recording and that you play and you hear as meaningful words what actually what happens is the vibrational frequency from your speaker goes into your ear canal and then that's your sensation and then your perception gets added to it and part of your perception getting added to it is your memory bank flooding forward and filling your brain in real time with the meaning of all the words I'm saying so that I can go on a wild rant like this and you don't have to worry when I'm on a wild rant about what the word wild means because your brain's already brought that right up to the front for you that's what I mean about perception being right up at the front with sensation that was a weird rant but I don't know felt decent okay so um language is a form of communication whether spoken written or signed that's based on systems and symbols language consists of words that are used by communities and the rules for using those words all like like i mean that's basic grammar all human languages have some common characteristics such as certain kind of organizational rules and this idea of infinite generativity so infinite generativity is Well, and this is what like an alphabet is so interesting in, right? So like say with Chinese caricatures or like with ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics where like certain things meant specific things. It's like if to learn Chinese is actually, to learn Mandarin is, is really difficult because it's, there's, it's basically like you, there is patterns and there is tones and in Chinese there, or in Mandarin specifically, there's like inflections they say, like, so you can say like ma, 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 like how you say like the A in that scenario, it's like, significant into how that what that word means it's called like an inflection but even with so like basically to learn mandarin is difficult because you have to basically memorize what everything means whereas like something like english it's alphabet based so things are spelt at least usually phonetically or based on how they sound and if something's based on how it sounds then you could create any made-up word in the world right you could say like I don't know, I'm going to make up something stupid, but you could make up a word and I could figure out how to spell it. And then we could figure out how to use it in a sentence. And like this ability to produce an endless number of words and also sentences and ways of doing it. It's like, it's been such a incredible cognitive tool for the human mind, right? And it's like, we know that orcas speak for sure. We know that monkeys have like, you can have a monkey that's never seen a hawk and you can put it in an enclosure with other monkeys and put a hawk in the enclosure and when the hawk flies over the monkeys will make a sound and the, the hawk that's never the monkey that's never seen a hawk will still look up right there's they've shown that there's different signals that monkeys give different sounds when it's a hawk versus a snake that's pretty darn close to language we know that orcas speak right to through frequencies we know that humpback whales sing. Humpback whales sing conversations with each other that can last like up to an hour. Conversations these long and parts of their songs are because <clears throat> during the 70s when like the whales were like really, really threatened. I hope the guy's name's slipping me, but there's this movement called Save the Whales, actually, and it was like what the guy did, it was genius is instead of trying to just make a theoretical argument to people what he did is he went out into the ocean and he had this like for at the time pretty advanced almost like an audio version of a gopro but like an audio submersible put it way down in the water where the humpbacks were and recorded them singing and then he went to all these like major european cities and played the whale sounds in those cities and like it's like these are the animals that are getting slaughtered and they like change public perception big time. And I'm talking about humpback whales because I was talking more generally about language, right? That like, yeah, infinite generativity means basically one of the cool things about language is that you can order it in different ways. You can say it in different things. You can say a unique sentence that never existed before you said it. It's got incredible flexibility, maybe not even infinite, because that would mean that like there's no limit at all. But infinite generativity means you can basically use it for whatever you want. You can generate an infinite amount of sentences or 
things you could say. So this is kind of neat, right? That like all over the world, infants tend to show this like kind of similarity that they their first vocalizations are crying and then they start to do this kind of cooing or gurgling or like basically trying to vocalize and then they start getting more into like babbling, which like you saw like my daughter doing a bit like, blah, 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 blah. like she's like in her head, she's probably talking. It's like and there's an interesting like she's understanding us more than she's able to communicate. So she's trying very hard to speak. She's very motivated to want to speak. And that's part of what's going to make her be able to speak pretty soon. It's like, that's just like dynamic system theory or whatever that we were talking about before. It's like part of that developing skill is the motivation coming from the environment to doing it. She wants to say something to me so bad. That's actually part of what's going to, that's the impetus or like the, it's the catalyst or like that's motivation would be the word, right? Motivation, something that adds motiveness movement locomotive anyways but yeah so it, it tends to go through that like crying cooing babbling gestures right like once the baby's getting like over one and especially if it's getting closer to two and it's not like pointing at anything it's not like a huge warning sign but it is like you might want to just basically get the kids hearing and vision checked because it might, oftentimes, if a kid's, like, not super responsive to their environment, sometimes, like, parents think it's, like, think the worst, that it's, like, some major developmental delay. And oftentimes, it has to do with, like, sensory stuff, like, having difficulty hearing or having, um, especially hearing. That's, like, the most common one. All right, my friends. I know this is, like, I still have 10 more slides. I still have a bit more to do here. I know these presentations are like epically long. I hope that they're not too bad. I'm trying to make them as decent and as interesting as I can. And I'm trying to give you like a good overview of this stuff. And Yeah, anyways, I'm just conscious of the fact I'm making these too long maybe. But I just hope that you, you learn from it. And... Uh, the problem is, is to make it shorter, I basically have to like cut out every rant and then I, I don't want to just like redo the slides because it's like you could just do that yourself. It's like I think part of what makes the teaching experience kind of neat is like like someone else could present you my, my slides, but what I try to add to it is like stories or like how this relates to this or like this is kind of interesting because of this. And that's why I'm kind of always like adding stuff, right, to try to hopefully make it a little more interesting. Okay, so anyways, Mike, yeah, 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 we know, you're the teacher, you've been doing it the whole time, quit explaining yourself. Okay, so long before kids learn, or an infant learns words, they can start to make fine distinctions between sounds and language. It's like, this is like so wild that actually what we find is that, and this is from Patricia Cole's research, really interesting uh, psychologist looking at the basic sound units of language and found that kids actually use like the little pieces of language, the phenomes is the word but the little pieces of language from all the languages, right? Maybe not every single language, because, like, it's theoretically possible that there's some, like, remote tribal language that, like, Charlotte wasn't muttering sounds of. But what that actually means isn't that my ch child saying, like, a Chinese, almost half of a Chinese word and then half of an Egyptian word. It doesn't mean that at all. <clears throat> it means that they have the vocal ability and the mental ability to go in any of those directions. And they're basically just playing with their vocal system. Um, it's not like they're like language savants and then they lose that. It's like, it's not that at all. It's that they have the potential to go in any direction. And this is actually really interesting. Is like, that next thing is like, especially in monolingual environments, that just means like a kid raised in an environment where they're like, say for example, only exposed to English, that after a certain amount of time, their ability to like learn all these other languages will actually go down. And in a weird way, your ability to become fluent and perfect a language in the process of doing that, you, you tend to lose your ability to understand other languages. And an exception to that is like a kid grown in or raised in a bilingual home, which is pretty interesting. Uh, cool then uses opera conditioning to see whether infants can discriminate phenomes universally. So what she'll do is she'll put a box with a toy bear in it, 
where the infant can see it. And then they'll get it to play different syllables like ba, 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 pa, pa, pa. And then they'll change it to something else. And if the infant turns its head to look at it, then you kind of suspect that the infant noticed that change. Okay. So her research demonstrated that from birth to six months, infants were, were citizens of the world, she said. They could tell the sound changed most of the time, no matter what language. But by the time they got over six months, and if they grew up in monolingual environments, so like just exposed to one language, that they get even better at noticing that change when it's their own language, the one that their parent speaks, but they will lose, gradually lose the ability to recognize differences that are not important to their own language. So what it's basically saying is as you're learning what's important to your language, you're also learning what you don't need to care about. And as you're learning what you don't need to care about, one of the byproducts of that is, well, now if you're like, so as I'm getting more and more focused to French, I'm going to notice a difference in Portuguese words less. It's a pretty neat idea. It just speaks to the amazingness of nature, right? That like, and I said this earlier a couple slides ago, but it's like why my daughter could have been raised by, like, if I had of all of a sudden moved to Ethiopia for work and learned how to speak Ethiopian and taught my daughter Ethiopian, she would have picked it up no problem, and just as easily as English. It's an, such an adaptable, such a flexible, adaptable skill, potential. So in infancy, I have here, yeah, yeah, the real challenge in language learning is segmentation, right, to like put it together, like it's difficult to put speech into words and to line it all up, right, a real challenge of language is learning the segmentation or like segments means pieces. Babies begin to solve this problem during the first year of life, initially they likely replay well, it's statistical information, right? Like they say back things that they hear more, hi, hi, hi. That's actually the one word my daughter does say is hi, 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 right? As infants get an increasing number of potential word forms from their speech, they start to stream what they hear. They start to begin to associate things with certain objects or perceptually available objects in their world. So they're noticing these patterns. They're starting to understand words. They're trying to tie things together. That's all segmentation means. They're starting to tie things together in terms of language. Another way you could say this is like they're starting to understand. They're starting to see the connection between things. They're starting to see things that like people say hi way more than they say other things. Right? Like so it's not weird that hi is the word that she learned because almost everyone that sees her probably says like hi Charlotte. Hi. Hi. Like it's just I say there's statistical frequency, but it's like it's not like she would have any idea what the word statistical frequency means, but that she would just notice it as like that's what everyone says. And that there's a difference between receptive vocabulary. This is pretty interesting, right? It's like a child can understand more words than they can speak. That's true with my six year old, too. It's like there's words that she would understand if I said it in a sentence, that if I put her on the spot, she would probably struggle in the moment to immediately put into a sentence. Like she'd be good with that with lots of words. My daughter's super creative like that. But like there's what I'm saying, though, is that there's if you said how many words can she take and put into a sentence, there'd be a certain number. And then it's like, OK, well, how many words could she understand if I said it? That's a higher number. Her receptive vocabulary is always going to be higher than spoken vocabulary. That's true for me, too. Like there's people that I could be listening to talking about, like something like philosophy or something, and I could like be understanding them but still have trouble like saying it back if I'm not fluent with like the kind of jargon or whatever, right? On, if, on average, infants understand about 50 words by the time they're a bit over one, right? So that's so wild to think about in relation to my kid who's like basically exactly 13 months. Right, that there's about 50 words she probably understands and that's probably true right like she probably understands her name and mom and dad and evelyn and hi and i don't know i don't know if i'd get to 50 but like she's starting to she's starting to get there
and there's gonna and she's getting close to this vocabulary explosion that's coming so on this one you see this idea that like this is showing like how old the kid is and then when kids tend to hit their first word right the first word can be anywhere from you know roughly nine months to roughly a year and a half so like a pretty big range and then usually from like a little after a year somewhere between that and the second year they, they have this major explosion in vocabulary right and a, a lot of the words that they're going to have early on are going to be very practical words like stairs and water and cup and candy and tv and mom and dad and bike and all the things that are in their immediate world right like they're not going to be thinking about like abstract concepts like you know freedom or something like that like obviously obviously like they're going to be thinking about like things that are like immediately objects mainly objects mainly nouns Telegraphic speech. It's kind of interesting, right? It's like in martial arts, so I say, don't telegraph what you're going to do. Don't like show me what you're going to do before you do it. It's like, well, telegraphic speech is like kind of like using the beginning part. It's like talk before you're talking, you're like kind of talking in this kind of clumsy way. It's like water me. It's like, it's like more more water water more water like i'm trying to talk like i'm probably looking ridiculous i'm trying to like talk like a little kid right it's just like short like precise words it's not like in a complete grammatical sentence it's like focused on just the thing the noun it's focused on right children tend to rely pretty heavy early on on things like gestures and tone and like using how intense they are is like a important signaler of intention or whatever these two word utterances emit many words and are remarkably succinct, like water now, or like, you know, I keep using that example, but it's this interesting idea that in every language, it seems like children, the speak that comes from, ch the, the spoken words that come from children tend to have this like, it says they're like economical quality, almost like they're like ch very specific. It's like practical. That makes sense, right? It's like taking a lot of work for the brain to learn these things. It's going to be learning the things that have most relevance first. Like, Daddy, give ice cream. So, like, Daddy, could I please theoretically have a piece of ice cream later this afternoon? Perhaps in a bowl, perhaps in a cone. It's like, Daddy, ice cream now! It's like, to convey meaning with limited words, the child relies heavily on gestures, tone, and context. Right? I put this as kind of interesting, or I didn't put this, but I put in this diagram. It says right at the bottom, right? Despite substantial variation in language input received by infants around the world, they follow similar paths of development, right? Like that, like, we tend to see crying and then cooing and starting to understand words and then starting to babble. Right, so that's kind of interesting, right? That as they start to understand words, then they immediately want to do it themselves. And then this starts to change from universal language to more language to specific, right? So it's like now Charlotte's mind's like really in the world of English. She's starting to use gestures and point more. She's starting to like understand more words. She's starting to like say hi now. Hi, hi, dada. She's been saying that for a long time too, right? Um, it always bugs moms because babies often say dada first and it's because it's just, for whatever reason, data is like really easy for a baby to say. Um, it's easier than like mommy. So like, it's not, it's not uncommon for a baby to say daddy first or data usually or da, dad or whatever, right? Then you see this first, first spoken word, usually a little bit after a year, then about a year and a half, this huge spike in vocabulary. And then, you know, around a year and a half to two years they start to see this more two utterance like daddy ice cream you know that kind of thing and then that plus this rapid increase in how many words they understand so there's two i thought two really interesting uh, parts of the brain i want to highlight here for you so some language scholars view that there's these remarkable similarities in how children require language all over the world they view that as strong evidence that language is bio has a biological basis, right? That there's 
an aspect of like learning language that's well when they say it has a biological basis they're basically saying it's not like just like some randomly learned activity that you were actually born designed you know and i i've mentioned before how that's a tough word because it demands the question of well what do you mean designed who designed what there's this particular region of the brain that seems to be designed for language right and these two re regions involved were discovered by brain damaged individuals the bracket area or the area of the left frontal lobe in the brain is involved in producing words right so when that area is injured people tend to have issues with like vocabulary right producing words Whereas the work, uh, Wernick's area, a region of the brain's left hemisphere, is involved in language comprehension. So people that have injuries there tend to have issues like understanding. So isn't it sort of interesting that in the part of my brain when I'm talking right now, that's basically feeding in the next line so I can just keep the rant going. It's like, is different than the part of my brain that's like, well, I guess they'd both be going pretty hard because I'm like reading this note right while i'm talking to you so like there's part of my brain that's like reading and making sense of what i'm reading and then i'm like kind of saying it in real time so it's like both those areas would be like heavily involved in this kind of very specific cognitive task of like reading uh notes into basically a teleprompter or into a tv into a powerpoint presentation yeah so basically Broca's area is the part involved in producing words and the Wernick's area is the part involved in understanding what they mean. And one of the main reasons we know about this is because of what the effect is when these areas are damaged. And really, that's why we know a lot about what a lot of the areas of the brain do, is when there's been specific individuals that have been hurt in specific ways, and we've seen that that type of injury was linked to this, and then maybe another person and another person and another person got hurt the same way, and then they all have this, these issues with they can't get the next thought out. They can't get that next word. They can't remember what they know what they mean, but they can't say it. It's like very common of someone with an with an injury to the Broca area. So damage, just to go a little bit further on this, like damage to either area causes a type of aphasia, it's called, right? So aphasia is this idea of a loss or impairment of your ability to use language. Um, individuals with damage to the Broca area have difficult pro difficulty producing speech. I was kind of already saying this, but but this is interesting, right? They have difficulty maybe talking because they're having trouble getting cued that next word from their brain. But if you're talking to them, they have no trouble understanding. It's not comprehension. It's not at that level. But someone with an, an in, uh, injury to the Wernick's area is going to have a lot of trouble comprehending. And unfortunately, that one's going to actually be a double negative because they're going to have trouble remembering what the what words mean. That then the likelihood that they're saying things that makes no sense is much higher, and that's like so devastating. And that's like you or your loved one. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me if I like yawn a little bit too. It's just like. It's only 8.30 here, it's not even that late, but with, uh, the baby hasn't been sleeping great, so. So I'm good, I'm all good, life's fine, I'm not complaining, I'm just, if I yawn a bit, it's, it's my pesky biology. My but okay, so anyways, there's, uh, biological influences on language development, right? Like, the ability to speak and understand language requires a certain vocal apparatus right you have to have like the voice box and the vocal cords able to do it you also have to have a nervous system that's able to like understand the environment you're in and your nervous system has a huge role in kind of basing you in your world the nervous system and the voice box of a, of our human predecessors so like of our ancestors changed over hundreds of thousands or even millions of years um if you're talking about like the predecessors of human homo sapiens sapiens uh, with advances in the nervous system and vocal structures, Homo sapiens sapiens developed speech. I, I didn't I didn't say that twice accidentally, right? So there's Homo sapiens and then there's Homo sapiens sapiens. All of you are Homo sapiens sapiens. That second saying it twice is kind of a recognition of like they think that roughly seventy thousand years ago there was a major brain advancement, right? They think that like 
humans have basically looked like us for roughly 200,000 years. So they say like anatomical humans. That's what that term means. But that like cognitively, if you were to go back in time and get a, and somehow like adopt a baby and then bring them to 2022 and raise them, how far could you go back and have a normal kid? Basically, it's probably about 70,000 years. Right, if you went back further than that, they'd probably look like a kid, like norm, like uh, quote unquote normal, but would probably be have probably have several developmental, be missing several key developmental components that would probably limit their cognitive development. Right, so like we have, there's quite a bit of evidence to suggest that about seventy thousand years ago there was this major jump in brain activity. Anyways, talk about getting on the wrong, to a different topic. If you're interested in that, there's a video on this site that's called. Uh, human origins that goes deep into that topic. Anyways, with advances in the nervous system and vocal structures, Homo sapiens developed speech. Our ancestors developed speech. Although estimates vary, many experts believe that humans acquired speech roughly 100,000 years ago, which in evolutionary time is very recent. So I want you to think about this. Our ancestors were definitely dreaming way before they were speaking, which is sort of interesting. They were having complex thought way before they were vocalizing. Gave humans an enormous advantage though over other animals, increased their chances of survival significantly. So Chomsky, interesting guy. Um, I don't agree with everything about Noam Chomsky, but his book, Manufacturing Consent, is an absolute classic. And and completely timely. Like you should definitely read Manufacturing Consent. Think about even just breaking down that title, how to get everyone to think the same thing. How to manufacture consent, right? And consent in this case is like, well, like how the government gets people to go along with things. Like Noam Chomsky is like a pretty interesting guy, but one of the, and he's a linguist. And one of the things he was interested in is, is he thought that it seemed like the brain of the child is born predisposed to learn language, but to say predisposed or pre-wired is the word he used there. What's that mean? It's like, what do you mean to say that the baby was like? Because again, I, get, I keep running into this wall of like, well, do you think it's God created? Or do you think nature created? Which would be another way of saying evolution. But either way, Chomsky thought that whether it was from nature or God, and let's just maybe set that argument aside, um, it seemed like it was pre-wired. Right? It seemed that these kids were born with this like ability to learn. Sorry, I know this chair is super squeaky. Ability to learn certain languages at certain times in certain ways. We know that there's an aspect of that that's true. We know that if children in incredibly abusive scenarios are like denied the ability to practice language early on. It can be almost some very difficult for them to develop language later. And even if they can develop some, it usually like taps out somewhere in the primary school ages level. It's like devastating for this for the human brain to not be exposed to language during key developmental years, like basically like birth to four or whatever. It's devastating for you to not be exposed to language at any time in life. Like we know that it takes there's only like the states and I think one other country in the world that allows solitary confinement because it, we know now that like sol entire, solitary confinement, like putting somebody in a cell by themselves with no interaction with anyone else for extended periods of time can take somebody that's completely mentally healthy and give them mental psychosis. You can create mental illness through isolation alone. It's one of the most devastating findings of psychology. Because Chomsky. Okay, so I kind of forget how I got to that point, so I'm just gonna come straight back. I was talking about pre-wired somehow, but yeah. So he thought that like kids were born, and, and I appreciate that, you, that. That I know you're not. I'm saying you let me do it. You might be just like fuming that I'm ranting so much, but like, I don't know. This is how I teach in person too. Is like, I'm not trying to make it interesting. Hopefully. I'll stop apologizing for my style. 
he said that children are born in the world with this like language acquisition device think about it. it's like they were your cell phone came with a gps it's like well you came with a led you came with a part of your brain pre-programmed to learn language a biological endowment something given to you by your ancestors so let me say that that gives you the ability to notice certain things in 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 uh, language so then just to give you a little bit of background so then like people have challenged this right because they've actually found certain tribes that have languages that don't conform to any of these kind of common grammar rules but this language acquisition device still um, is an interesting point and, and accounts for a lot of it this led is a theoretical construct not a physical part of the brain it's not like you actually have like a hard drive slot for this but it's like it's not hard to make the argument that it seems like the entire well, a huge part of infancy is about this development of both the cognitive ability to produce language and understand it and then like the physical ability to generate the actual sound yes yeah, so it's tough because chomsky did this study of like thousands of languages and then they like he showed that like all these languages have these like common kind of ways of saying it like you say things that happen first and then things that happen later after and there's all these like rules of language that like until you actually sit down and start to parse out are kind of difficult to see and if you only know english like me it's hard to see the rules of your language because you just follow them it's like sometimes easier when you start or hard but it's easier to see when you're trying to learn a new language if you're like trying to learn french and you're like well why is everything like masculine and feminine it's like well that's how french operates and that's actually like it's a very gendered language so it's like that's you have to kind of learn that right so what he found is that there's these like commonalities and then like some people some critics have argued that there's like a couple like tribal um really kind of unique languages that seem to break his rule so therefore it's like totally garbage and it's like eh, he found an exception an interesting exception in general i think chomsky's like pretty close to right but that point's important that he's not talking about an actual thing your brain doesn't actually have a language acquisition device he's kind of talking metaphorically it's like it it seems as if the brain of the child is born pre-programmed that at this that it's going to start to notice things and then it's going to start to try to recreate those sounds and then it's going to start to babble and then it's going to start to do this and it's like it's almost like how things go through stages right like it's a very common theme in developmental psychology i uh, my see <laughs> i don't know why i also said i was going to do like a, a rodeo guy like announcer voice i'll just talk in my normal voice the final lightning round I don't know why we called it lightning round, but let's go with it. The lightning round where I'm just going to go over some main points. Okay, most development follows this cephalocicotal, remember, uh, from the head down, and proximotal from the middle out pattern. Physical growth is rapid in the first year of life, but slows in the second year. We see these dramatic change in, changes in the characteristics of brain development in the first two years. The neurons are being born, the synapses are forming, they're being pruned. We're seeing these major structures emerge. The neuroconstructivist view is increasingly popular. This idea that like your developing brain and your developing ability to think are tied together. And as your the brain's developing, you're thinking more complex. And as you're thinking more complex, that's like encouraging continued construction so that it's like kind of a back and forth. Sleep patterns are correlated with cognitive development, like this idea that like the baby's sleeping a lot in infancy and dropping into sleep very quickly within their sleep, like they're going to sleep in within you know 10 to 15 minutes, they're in dream state where you're maybe taking 50 minutes, right? So like the sleep patterns seem to be what they think is the reason for that is that it's this increase emphasis of sleep early on because it helps build the, the mind of the child. Okay, number six, reflexes are basically automatic movements that govern the newborn's behavior. Right now, I was making the point that if you kind of like think about it, it's pretty wild. It's like a behavior that's not learned. We talked about this idea of dynamic systems theory, right? Like Charlotte reaching for the for the uh, cheesy. It's like one of the things that's helping her get that fine motor ability with her fingers is like her wanting to pick up things like cheesies. It's a powerful motivation. 
we see the emergence of these gross motors. So remember, gross, this is weird because sometimes gross means like big. Like if you, someone says, oh, that's a gross exaggeration, that means like that's a huge exaggeration. It's weird because usually we mean gross to mean like disgusting. But gross motor skills means like big things like walking and crawling and jumping. Fine motor skills means like small things like handwriting or picking up a fork. Number nine, sensation occurs when information interacts with your sense receptors, right? Your eyes, your ears, your taste buds in your mouth, your um, hairs in your nose and your skin. Perception is inter in the interpretation of that sensation, how you make sense of that. Visual and depth perception improves as the infant gets older. Intermodal perception, so that idea of like when you're walking into the room, you're like hearing and seeing things and you're maybe smelling the scenario and you're kind of making sense of that all at once. You're using multiple channels, sort of intermodal perception. Nature and nurture interact in perceptual development. So our biology influences, but also our learned experiences and kind of the life we've lived and what we've been through in our memory system influences how we make sense of things, right? Because you see somebody and it reminds you of someone that you've met before. I see that same person that doesn't remind me. It's like, well, why did we have such a different experience besides the obvious fact that you met someone that I didn't? Well, because we both played the image of the new person or whatever off of our mental memory bank and yours came back with a file that said, like basically recognized and not liked and mine came back with nothing so we like we're playing our information that we're sensing off of different memory banks that's heavily or different memory systems that's heavily influencing our perception of the situation oh. okay next in piaget's theory children construct their own cognitive worlds they build mental structures to adapt to their world right through this process of assimilation and accommodation Piaget argued that babies don't understand object permanence until eight to nine months. Object permanence being that idea of like, when dad does peekaboo, he's not like coming in and out of reality. Objects are permanent, even when you're not aware of them. Right, and it's like, if you're sitting here listening to me at like 22 years old or something, you're like, yeah, no kidding. But there's a point where you didn't know that. There was a point where you were one and a half and peekaboo would have worked on you, right? But then there was a point where you were, or probably like one, then there's a point when you're one and a half where it stopped working. And that actually represents a change in cognitive ability. Recent research suggests that baby may understand uh, object permanence even earlier than we think. It may be born with certain core knowledge, which is pretty wild. It's like, you know, all this that we're starting to learn more and more of how like just deep and interesting genetics are and how babies aren't as blank slate as people thought. Babies aren't blank slates at all. It's kind of a ridiculous argument. They're heavily embedded genetically. Now they're blank slate in the sense that they're like, tr the way that they're parented and the way that they experience their social world shapes them. The blank slate implies that you're like drawing on a empty chalkboard. Baby's certainly not an empty chalkboard. There's major differences between kids, as you know, and as we've been talking about this whole time. And lastly, social cognition develops in infancy. This idea of our cognition being linked with our social world, right? That we're starting to like, we're going to get into this next week too, that like my daughter's starting to like laugh based on whether I'm laughing, right? Like she'll do something, then she'll look straight at me. And if I laugh, then she thinks it's hilarious. But that's called like social referencing we'll talk about that but it's kind of interesting right that like she's taking a cue on whether it's funny from well does dad think it's funny so you survived i hope you're uh feeling okay about this presentation this was quite the presentation i know that it was i did this over multiple days multiple i started it completely unshaven i finished it shaved and went through several wardrobe changes anyways it's like I appreciate that like I don't know I, I try not to I try to like as much as I can in our small interactions like give you a glimpse of kind of who I am in a bit and like I know it's kind of this microphone's a pretty good listener but I, I know I just ramble sometimes but I appreciate you and 
again, I, I say this a lot, but I do mean it. Like, I appreciate that my interactions with Nipissing are incredibly positive and, like, um, in a confusing and sometimes tough world that's, like, appreciated. All right, so look back over your notes, do the quiz. You have two chances on the quiz. I'll take the highest mark. You're going to do great. And uh, thanks for being such a cool group. All right. I'll be back with more soon. I won't be around this weekend. This weekend, I'm, I'm going to get this presentation up and get the test all set up. And again, remember, the test is not due tomorrow just because it's going to come out tomorrow. It's not due for like way over a month, right? So it's like it's not due until sometime in November. I don't have the date right in front of me. But I just did a video about it. Or I just did the up. I just sent it to you. You'll be able to find it. If you can't find it, message me. Oh, a big yawn right at the end. Oh, no, I've been trying pretty good to hold it back. It's like, like I said, it's like just, I love you guys. I love making these videos. It's just, you know, sleep's been hard to come by. On that note, I'm going to start rendering this and I might, like, go lay down. Love yous. Stay well. And uh, stay curious. Cheers. <laughs>